Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to you all to our debate on the European health data space. Today's debate is hosted by the IF Steering Committee member Eva Kaili, who is Vice President of the European Parliament with the SD Group from Greece. And she's a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, among many other things that I won't list uh, right now, Eva, but everybody thank knows you. you. <laughs> and thank you very much for taking the lead um, on this debate at uh, the European Internet Forum. I will leave the floor in a minute. Um, before doing so, I'd like to welcome uh, the speakers uh, and all the panelists that have joined us uh, today. Andre Ries, who is Director of uh, Health Systems, Medical Products and Innovation at the G Sante European Commission. We're also joined by Francesco Bonarroti, Chair of the Executive Council for Health at Digital Europe, by Annemieke Olenius, Deputy Director General at the Swedish eHealth Agency, and last but not least, by Richard Price, Head of Policy at the European Cancer Organization. Thank you all very much for joining us. I will now leave the floor to um, Vice President Eva Kaili, and then we will listen to all our panelists and a question and answer session will follow afterward. Eva, the floor is yours. First of all, um, uh, thank you all and welcome to this uh, very interesting event um, that's organized by the European Internet Forum. I am a member since I remember myself entering the European Parliament. Um, and it's uh, always hosting timely events, uh, very important for the um, European legislation. And uh, I would also like to thank Maria Rosa de Ghibellini uh, because she is the spirit of EIF and also thanks to her, we managed to, um, to have all our meetings, even during COVID nonstop, that they have been um, uh, really not just helpful, but they have been driving uh, legislation uh, decisions um, during this time. So for those uh, who don't know it, just to mention that uh, I've been appointed uh, from s and as the Rapporteur for the uh, European Health Data Space. Uh, um, so it, it's going to be not just one committee, it's going to be the EPRE that uh, Maria Rosa has mentioned, but also there's going to be a shared responsibility with Envy and uh, LIBE. Um, so the, I think what I should start before I um, uh, I, I end I mean, in discussions with you, is that the proposal uh, seems that it could be a real breakthrough in the way patients access their data. Um, it's uh, extremely important to form, uh, let's say, a part of both the 2020 data strategy, but also a crucial element of the European Health Union. And again, this was accelerated with the COVID crisis. It can prove to be uh, basically a game changer for uh, for health policy. Uh, I think we should highlight, uh, because a lot of people are telling me, but all these things have been covered with the GDR and uh, you have the, the uh, Data Governance Act and um, the NIST directive. Well, actually, uh, it's important to note that it's going to build on those uh, initiatives and uh, they are horizontal frameworks that they will all provide rules including security measures that apply to the health sector um, and what we will try to do is to create incentives for member states to create a an interoperable but really interoperable easily accessible and helpful uh, health data space um, not at the state level also but of course at the european level um, I can give you immediately an example. During the crisis in the beginning of COVID, um, ECDC um, had the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control of the European Union had access to 80% of, uh, of data, but random data in uh, gathered, collected in a different manner uh, per sector, per member state, different languages. So not interoperable at all. And uh, we lost a lot of time by understanding the patterns of the disease and the treatments and also the, um, the numbers. Um, so I think also it would be wonderful to have a prescription from, uh, for a chronically ill person to be respected and realized in all EU member states, not to have to go back in your member state to find the exact prescription or a situation. I mean, it has happened to me. I think it happened to all of us uh, here 
or a situation where a doctor that is not a general practitioner can still access our full health history without constantly asking things to us that we don't even remember um, and be able to choose the most appropriate treatment based on a comprehensive overview of our health results. So I think if we manage to achieve that, it's, it's really going to be a, a breakthrough. Um, there is obviously um, a further area of use of our health data, um, of course, for the industry. Um, if we manage to have them anonymous and also uh, pseudonymous, uh, they could be very helpful in the research on innovative treatments. Access to data is, is one of the obstacles. I, I remember I had a dinner with uh, uh, within STOA, um, the science and technology um, think tank we have, and all the Nobel Prize winners, they were telling us, we need access to good quality of data. I thought they would ask for money or like uh, recognition or workshops or to remove other obstacles, but they wanted access to data. So I think obviously we need to do that in compliance with GDPR. And uh, th there is a, um, an interesting balance we need to achieve to have, I mean, to always um, uh, uh, take under consideration security and trust that we need to build with citizens in order for them to be able to use also um, even health applications they don't unless they trust really an app or the doctors that they are um, working with, they have been uh, supportive of, of such innovations. Um, and there will be two dimensional approach with two distinct uses of health data, um, the primary and secondary use, where we're going to have um, initially better healthcare at the national cross border level um, to allow people to access their health data basically and then make them available but have full control of their data um, and um, improve everything, not just the diagnosis but also the treatment. Um, member states will be required to participate in cross-border digital infrastructures. Um, I think this is ex extremely important because this could mean also we're going to have a stronger digital health authority um, to ensure additional rights for the individuals and uh, also to um, for, the, for the necessary safeguards for the implementation. The secondary use um, it's, it's basically when health data are being processed uh, to inform and access uh, public health policies or to conduct research. And um, I think it's extremely important because um, it has to deal with new medicines, new medical devices. And we all have been discussing in, in other events about personalized medicine and treatment and also products um, relying on artificial intelligence. So I think it's um, a missing piece of this puzzle. Um, finally, I don't want to take more of the time, but uh, we, we do need to have a European uh, Health Data Space Board to have a governance that is going to happen at the European level. Um, again, to address problems that uh, will occur, and I think also patients' associations that could also be uh, relevant and collaborating uh, with it, it would be necessary. So we are starting now to discuss, I think uh, we're going to have interesting debates. And um, I have been working on new technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain. Blockchain's first pilot project was on my health, my data, how we can control our data. Uh, so we had, we were uh, like a step ahead, how we can give access and revoke this access to our doctor and how with AI, we can even predict diseases if we have good quality of data. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to listen to the real experts here. And my obligation is to make sure that we will translate uh, your ideas into legislation to allow these dynamics that we can get from, uh, from sharing of data um, to accomplish the best for our citizens. Thank you again for, um, for organizing such an amazing event. Thank you very much, uh, Eva, for setting the scene for, for this uh, discussion with your valuable uh, insights on, uh, on this breakthrough initiative as you defined it. Now we will listen to Andre Ries with DG Sante. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, uh, Ms. Kali, for a beautiful uh, introduction to, the, uh, to, to this uh, Important legislation, uh, because as, a, as one of the co-author of this of this proposal, I am very proud of what we have done, and I hope our um, discussion in the European Parliament uh, will be, as you as you rightly said, deep and important. So because it's a it's a quite quite uh, important legislation, 
and I, I, I fully agree it's a, it's a game changer. Um, we started uh, almost from blank page, uh, trying to see the needs of different uh, uh, stakeholders in the, in the, in the system. Um, uh, really also learned from a uh, from number of experience from COVID, but also before the COVID. For sure, COVID was, uh, again, the pu push for, for all, in many areas of health policies across Europe. Uh, and, and, and as you also rightly said, this is one of the pillar of, 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 of the concept of European Health Union, uh, because it's, it's, it's important that, that the data are, are uh, first collect, second shared, uh, thirdly moved, and, uh, and also make, uh, make our um, kind of work in different uh, sectors possible. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, about the specificity of health data, and I think this is this in health sector. Uh, this is something which I think is important as well in the discussion. We will we'll, uh, we'll have it, but but w w for, for me, that number of 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 of, of important, you know, um, assessment when you when you go to the health sector first, health data, primary health data that are produced in the in the hospitals or or doctors' office also by sometimes in the, in the research, um, they are becoming, you know, uh, the, 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 the material uh, or ingredient for, for, for research data. So this is not always in, the, in other sectors when you have such, you know, close interlink. It means that quality of primary health data is very important for the output of the, of the research or R&D sector, or also, you know, evaluation of, of medicines by, by European Medicines Agency or by health technology assessment, or even, you know, think about uh, successful pre health prevention or, or pricing policies. So, so, so this is why, why it's important to, to take care of the, of the first of the primary health data. And this is why in this legislation, we, we, we really have a number of provisions, and I, I'm sure this will be discussed also in the European Parliament, uh, allowing you know the tertiary legislation, uh, helping with the implementation because the sector is very dynamic. We are learning very very many things in, in relatively short time, and 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 we believe that there is a need for some technical uh, explanation. Number of issues like standards, like nomenclatures, all these things we are developing as I speak. But but they, of course they will change because this is the nature of the of this of this of this uh, kind of kind of work. Uh, the, the other important uh, issue you, you mentioned, and I, I fully agree, the trust and security. I mean, this is when we cross across the the, the, the field. It's a, it's a, we try to explain you know, in both pillars, primary health data and secondary health data. There is a uh, how trust can be achieved through the governance, through the through through the access, through the the way. Uh, our data are protected the way uh, we, we can we can also uh, make make our um, decisions you know even punish those that are misused the, the data in the, in, in, on the against the individuals uh, or, or even even groups of, of individuals so so I think this is also important to to, to see this and and, 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 and and this is also somehow in the public debates uh, with the user of data with also with those they are deciding uh, to, 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 to access those data, we, we really have to make sure this is, this is very clearly stated. Um, the, the third point I would like to, to also referring to you, it's, uh, it's uh, to, 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 your, to your introductory, I think it's, uh, it's what you said about Nobel Prize winners. You know, you, you, you are right, you know, this, uh, we, we heard this many times, data, it's new currency, and and for sure in the in in, in health field we, we 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 need to make them work better. We see this often that uh, this repetition of collection of data. Often you see that the research projects in the budget always have the such uh, place when you when you spend money on collection of data, standardizing the data, but also make them um, uh, analyze. Which of course this is good, rather part which which of course should be should be additionally. Um, paid, but 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 collecting data, standardizing, buying new software, buying new databases, it's a, it's it's I think sometimes it's too much, this over overspending, and finally uh, the other 
other question which which was you know in the in this the debate when we were pre presenting the the, the 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 working on the proposal with the governments i think the uh, based on the experience and also in the, in the different member states but also our own observations also the the quite successful work of european uh, e-health network which uh, during covid time we are still in covid time but but in the in the in the, in the last uh, two and a half years met over 300 times helping to establish you know the the right tools like for example um, uh, digital covid sex, uh, certificate was a huge success first because it, it was done in in very short time secondly because it was uh, agreed by all by legislators but also by technical uh, experts and and thirdly it was introduced it worked and, and, and 40, I think, is also important. It's become the global standard. So we show as the Europeans, we can do things together and we make them available to citizens and, and, and also we make them uh, global uh, as a standard. So, so governance is important and, and this will be important also to make sure that uh, citizens, but also researchers and, and industry understand how to access those data and where are the limits, there, where are the, the potential also uh, challenges of the of this of this exercise, including ethics, uh, because this issue also was discussed under under uh, French presidency, which I think is also quite interesting area to be to be discussed uh, even today. So there are some remarks, you know, just to, as a starter. Uh, happy to continue. Thank you, uh, Maria Rose, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for sharing your views as proud co-author of the uh, uh, proposal, as you said. Now, we will listen to a different point of view with Francesco Bonarroti at Digital Europe. Yeah, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your introduction before. Um, I'm representing the Executive Council of Health from Digital Europe which is a group form for combining diversity of experience. So we have, um, for sure, technical uh, technology company. We have telecommunication company, pharmaceutical, med tech, uh, which represent big corporations, but also small size company and also startups. Um, I heard before me, data is a new currency. Everyone wants to have the currency. But I think what we have to recognize is there's this a unique momentum that we see the convergence of science and technology, which is opening very new, um, new possibility for research. Uh, and that's, I think, the right moment as we come together. And we firmly believe that if we unlock the health data, um, we, can, we can do and, and, and address unmet needs. I mean, beat cancer, I see the European Cancer, Richard represented the European Cancer Organization, uh, but also, um, in general, better treatments and, and also support healthcare profession and establish also more resilient healthcare system. Uh, we believe, on the other hand, that we don't have the luxury of time. It's not, um, we have an aging population yeah. in Europe, and um, um, which is increasing. Uh, on, on one hand, we have already 4.2 million people diagnosed with cancer, and given the aging population, we expect also to reach the 5.2 million by 2040. Everyone's go back to COVID uh, and the experience of COVID, which has been at links in expert forum we were discussing before, but it was not public discussion. Uh, the fact that the health data is much too silent, uh, I think it was very, was coming from everyone's very, very, very evident. Uh, there is too much fragmentation and, and lack of, of interoperability of standards as uh, Ms. Rees was referring of, of harmonizing, trying to let data speak to each other. Uh, and for sure, another area that is, needs to be addressed, especially for research, is allow health data to be exchanged over borders. Research is seldom a matter which is only in, in, in one country. Um, this requires critical collaboration across member states uh, and, and the more harmonized approach uh, in the implementation of privacy rules. When we come together as a council, um, the first question that we sense we felt we had to address is the question of trust, like everyone was mentioning before me. And we issued a paper in uh, 2021 uh, which uh, published a report with four pillars uh, to build a trustworthy digital health ecosystem. So in the paper, we refer to these four points. The first is that for sure we have to demonstrate 
uh, benefits for health, for the health communities. So including patients, healthcare professional, innovators, policy makers, healthcare systems. Second, and that's more also from, from a technology side, how do we secure to, to ensure a secure interoperable infrastructure, allowing for the very sensible data that we are here speaking about. Third point is that we have for sure leverage existing health data sharing success we have already, which have some of the characteristics of, of trust uh, that we already see. And, and last but not least, as fourth point, uh, the problem of digital health literacy for patients, but also for practitioners, and also making sure that he health service that we design are done with the patients of the center. We have now the proposal of the European Health Data Space, and, and for sure the wish from our point is that above all, European level rules should harmonize and simplify and incentivize innovation and making sure that we don't have a burden the healthcare sectors. Uh, and of course, we need to raise the bar for the entire European Union, Union making sure that we don't, we don't leave countries behind. We had already very good example in, in the Nordics, for access for data in Finland especially, uh, and, and now we see France, but we have to make sure that we have uh, this for, for whole European um, member states. When we speak about secondary use, uh, I think we have to make sure that we can, uh, research and innovators need to work on a bigger scale and have more analytical possibilities to address what we were mentioning before and find new treatments uh, or, or diagnostic approach um, or even preventive approach uh, for, for diseases. And it, that's about anonymization. There is for us one nounces on um, when we probably justify data linkage should be possible without, um, so should be possible without identifying the individual, but it's key for prevention and treatment possibility, especially for rare disease. And we shouldn't forget that 30 million patients are affected by rare disease in European Union already now. So, and the ask, as we have some experience with GDPR interpretation, let's make sure that we avoid uh, a regulation that fragments European Union more than we had before. Um, that's for sure why we are here also today to discuss that can be done all in partnership with uh, different point of view for different stakeholders. And I'm very happy that uh, we'll be followed by, by, by Richard Price representing the patients, but also to Anemika, which will speak also bring uh, the perspective of public sectors. So we, we are happy from our side to have this discussion with you and looking forward to cooperate to, to this, yeah, to this unique opportunity that's the European health data space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for sharing uh, your point of view with us, representing various stakeholders. And uh, you have touched upon the challenges, of course, of this uh, proposal. Um, you have also mentioned the importance of the collaboration between member states. And indeed, now I'd like to give the floor uh, to Annemieke uh, Alenius with the Swedish eHealth Agency. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to tell you a bit about our thoughts in Sweden about the e-health, uh, uh, the European health data space. And thank you very much to the previous speakers as well and for the EIF for arranging this debate. Um, I'm also one of the members of the e-health network and I can assure you that we had a lot of work uh, with the COVID certificate, but we're very, very proud of that work that we did together with the European Commission and um, all other member states. But as the subject is about the European health data space, I would like to take the opportunity to address the importance of trust. And I have some pictures I would like to share with you, uh, some slides. Um, I assure, I'm sure you see them by now. Um, in Sweden, we have a very important principle. You know, we have a lot of data in Sweden uh, about our citizens, a lot of health data, but that is also a, a result of a, a culture which is for, uh, mainly based on a principle of public access. Sweden has a very long history of transparency and its inhabitants have very large rights to get access to public data and also to get um, 
um, um, uh, the right to take part in different kind of public affairs, to attend court hearings, to, to attend public political meetings, and also all, all documents in the public sector, they are available to the citizens. So we have a culture of uh, transparency. And um, that culture, which has been a long term commitment, has enabled us to have about 100 quality national quality registers. Some of them, they are uh, they are about 50 years old by now. And we've been collecting this data for many years. In Sweden, we have a personal identification number. So it's also easier to collect data around an individual that way. But um, the the import and the the, um, the way we have been able to do that is by building this trust and this transparency. And um, Therefore, I would like to, to show for you also um, uh, the results of one of our latest uh, um, um, uh, surveys, which shows that 93% of the Swedish uh, inhabitants want to share their health data. That's a very, very high uh, amount of people, uh, and it's m m the highest uh, um, a part, the highest uh, pr percentage is for those uh, is concerning promoting medical research. Sweden has a very strong life science sector and also very good experiences of, of um, a medical um, research. But trust, I would like to stress once more, trust is the most important condition for sharing data. Uh, therefore, it's important that, that the citizens have the right to access their own data. In some parts of Sweden, we all have access to the data uh, about us, um, which we can access. I can access all my data, for example, if I want to. Um, but um, we have to be very, very... I want I I want the same as you. I also have high ambitions concerning the European health data space, but we should do this very very carefully because if we once lose the trust of our citizens, and it doesn't have to be just a public authority that may that makes a mistake, it can be also another uh, organization. It will affect the people's uh, will to share their data and then we'll get bias in the data and then we can't use it for example for the research we would like to perform. So I think working with minimum data sets, working with improving the digital literacy, working of course with increasing interoperability is all is important but we should not forget that it, uh, in the end, it's the individual that wants to share his or her data that is uh, necessary for a European health data space. That's my main message. And thank you for being able to share it with you. Thank you very much, uh, Annemieke, for um, your uh, comprehensive presentation on the uh, uh, Swedish uh, situation, um, a positive one, perhaps the first in class in the EU, uh, but uh, we can certainly learn uh, from it. And now, last but not least, the floor goes to Richard Price with the European Cancer Organization. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, perhaps to, in order to give you the perspective of the European Cancer Organization, a few brief words on who we are. Uh, so we're an umbrella federation of 41 different European and international, primarily healthcare professional organizations, and we're united by the mission of improving patient outcomes through multidisciplinarity. And we're supported in doing that with 22 international and European cancer patient organizations. And so in the policy realm, what we try to do is try and find and create consensus within the cancer community on key topics like the European health data space and promote that to relevant decision makers. So at the European Cancer Organization and in the cancer community broadly, there's been a, an enormous interest in health data and oncology data cooperation for a long time. So when something like the European health data space comes along, uh, there's a great deal of excitement. 
but also a sense of responsibility and urgency. We've got to get this right. This sort of opportunity doesn't come along very often, and we don't want to be in 10 years' time looking back and thinking, oh, we missed some opportunities there. We're highly conscious as well of the typical barriers that are faced when trying to take on the, this sort of ambition. Regulatory barriers, lack of standardization, interoperability, sometimes lack of political will, or just poorly directed political will. Um, so in that sense, in terms of our commentary to the decision makers at the moment in the Commission, the Parliament and elsewhere, I'll just summarize um, through our digital health network where we've been thinking. And the number one thing is getting trust right. And we uh, it's been commented already, I think, in the remarks, but we think the legal proposal might be improved in this regard. So there's a governance section, for example, which details a health data space board. And in EU initiatives, there are generally good and bad practices to learn from in this respect. But we think the good practice to learn from is the European Medicines Agency, for example. And there are defined places in their board for patients and for healthcare professionals. And it makes a real difference because they bring in the perspectives, they're there and present at the decisions, and they also help with the long-term strategy making. So that's a proposal we'll be putting forward to the parliament on this. Number two is facing up to known implementation barriers. And in the cancer community, much in our mind is GDPR, for example. So we know that this very well-intentioned piece of legislation and, and a lot to admire in it, but unfortunately with its implementation, there has been some chilling effects reported to us on cross-border cancer research. So we think in terms of the, the health data space, maybe there's some opportunity to face up to that and uh, perhaps have, for example, commission studies uh, agreed to, to um, investigate the impacts the GDPR has had and get those issues remedied, identified early. Number three, I think, has been ambitious on the implementation agenda, and we think perhaps that the, the, the proposal could be supported with some goals for in the implementation area. So uh, we know that for decades and perhaps, you know, but certainly for a long time, we've been talking about the issues of lack of interoperability in areas like cancer registries, maybe some committed to goals that, that the parliament is committed to, member states are committed to, the commission are committed to, could give the momentum that's necessary to push things further faster. Number four is around implementation support. So in the cancer field, in the Beating Cancer Plan, there's some very ambitious goals in other areas, like creating uh, an EU network of comprehensive cancer centers. Um, and I think some of the challenges are similar because you've got um, a target that you want all countries to get to, but you've got the reality that um, there's a very diverse picture of, of infrastructure across Europe to support that. And what's happened in, in the field of um, the EU network of comprehensive cancer centres is to acknowledge that and to make EU funding available to support countries in growing their um, comprehensive cancer centre infrastructure. And I think a similar approach on the European health data space would be very welcome and, and perhaps uh, assuage some concerns there. And then just a couple of final remarks. So um, there has been uh, a period of time where the parliament has been um, deciding which committees are going to lead the scrutiny. And we have this joint scrutiny by LIBA and MV. So that's looking at uh, civil rights and at the health perspectives. And I think it's really important that what should not emerge or it would be uh, unfortunate if it did emerge is any sense that somehow uh, patient safety and patient patient data safety and confidentiality is somehow mutually exclusive with a powerful European health data space. I don't think that's the case at all. So I think that um, things like getting the governance right can perhaps hopefully stop that from becoming a, a, a maybe a, a bit of a, a, a poor environment for, for the scrutiny. And the last remark is, um, I think let's not also underplay the potential of the European health data space. I think um, we should look to see if the legislation can give mandate to those who are implementing it to see how internationally uh, other, whether it be the UK, Switzerland, uh, Israel, or even other countries abroad might be able to plug into this system in, in different ways. I think we need to be future focused in that regard and also keep in mind what are we trying to do? We're trying to improve patient care, cancer care, research, and whichever things that are necessary to do that, let's have an open mind and be pragmatic about it.